to um here we go recording <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about um John Thompson and his and the, his uh, selection of his photographs I I think like most people that study Southeast Asia whether it's particularly Thailand or Cambodia um we're quite familiar with his photography because as we'll look at in this lecture he's the first person to photograph um, some of the kings of Siam. He's the first person to photograph uh, Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Um, but a lot of us haven't really looked into his his sort of life and career in a lot of depth. Um, so it's quite these exhibitions that Betty Yao and Narissa um, Chakrabong have organized, I think, as Helen was saying, there was the China one was here a few years ago as well, are really important because they they shed much more of a light on his life and career. Um, it's interesting, he was very famous during his career. Um, uh, so he's a very well-known uh, photographer for his time. And then I think in, it, he's sort of been rediscovered in the past 10, 15 years through these, um, through these exhibitions. But yeah, today what I wanted to really focus on is is taking you through some of his major uh, achievements, I guess. Um, so we'll start by looking at Siam, uh, which is modern day Thailand, of course, uh, modern day kingdom of Thailand. And we'll end with uh, the streets of London. This is something I was quite unfamiliar with that actually when he returns to the United Kingdom, um, he spends quite a lot of time then in the later half of his career photographing um, street scenes in, in the UK. And, and, it's, and as I'll sort of argue today he's in a way the sort of an early pioneer of what we would today call photojournalism. Um, so it's quite he's quite important in in that respect as well. Um, yeah, you maybe you're familiar with this photo. This is actually uh, John Thompson here um, on the in the center. All right, let me just go on to this one. Yeah, so as I said, we'll start. Uh, geographically speaking, we'll start in Singapore. Uh, this is where he first set up shop, quite literally. Um, then we'll move to um, Siam, or Siam, which is modern day Thailand. Uh, then we'll have a, a look at Cambodia. From there, he actually moves uh, to Hong Kong. And it's from Hong Kong that he starts to explore China. Um, this is what he's most fa famous for is his, his photo photography of China. Um, and so he, he actually goes on quite sort of multiple trips um, to what we would refer to as the treaty ports mainly. These are the the trade ports that were opened after the um, Treaty of Nanking and the, the Opium Wars in the 19 or 1840s. Um, yeah, and then we'll come back and we'll finish with the, the streets of London, which is not part of the exhibition. Um, at the Russell Coates, but I thought it's a nice way to, to round out the discussion and his career. And there's some sort of parallels between how he approaches his subject matter, both within um, the Far East and back in, in London. Just a quick biography of him. Maybe you're familiar from, from, uh, from the exhibition, but in, it, it's good to sort of recap anyway. Yeah, he's born, he's he's actually Scottish. He's born in Edinburgh in um, 1837, and he dies in 1921. So he lives well into his 80s. Um, what's interesting is he apprenticed as to a local optical and scientific instrument manufacturer at first, and he also studied chemistry. Um, and this, this, these two skill sets that he, that he acquired early on really helped him then in terms of his photographic career, obviously in terms of um, the optical side of it, in terms of understanding camera lenses um, and the, the functioning of the actual apparatus of a camera. But of course, at that period as well, they also had to prepare their own um, plates, uh, glass plate negatives, which was a chemical process. So he he managed early on to, to actually master both of those skills, I think, which then set him on his way as, as quite a successful photographer. Um, in April 1862, um, he leaves Edinburgh for Singapore and he follows his brother. His brother is already, his older brother is already out there as a watchmaker and photographer. Um, and he spends 10 years in 
in Asia in total. This again, this is him here on the on the left. This is another, I guess, um, self portrait or, or or selfie we might call it today of him during his um, during his one of his China expeditions. Um, yeah, he establishes a photographic portrait studio in Singapore. Um, what's interesting is the portraiture is sort of is his bread and butter. That's his his actual what he gets paid for is taking portraits of people um, at the time. So that's a sort of day job if you want to put it in sort of modern terms. Um, but I suppose what is his true love or his real passion is actually more what we, what we might sort of think of more sort of photojournalism or sort of more artistic forms of, of photography. And that's what he's famous for. Um, what's interesting though, is that while we have well, we have surviving photographs from him, from Siam, from Cambodia, from China, streets of London, his London oeuvre as well. To date, there's been very little to no photographs found um, from his time in Singapore. Um, so actually there's quite a few people sort of rummaging around archives in, in Singapore and abroad trying to, to locate John Thompson photographs or a cache of, of John Thompson work. I, Presumably, most of it is because it's portraiture and that's a, their private commissions. They would have not been collected by him. They would have been in the possession of, um, of obviously the the people who commissioned the families who commissioned portraits, uh, probably mainly colonial British colonial uh, families in Singapore, but probably also wealthy Singaporeans as well at that point. Um, but yeah, so it's a little bit of a mystery as to as to where or if those photographs survive. This this one on the screen. Actually, I it's um it's from Wikipedia, which of course is not the best or most reliable of sources. Um, but it claims that it is a photograph from Singapore. I'm not quite sure whether it is or not. There's no actual source given. Um, but just to sort of raise that idea that there is this this sort of missing uh, or potentially sort of missing cache of of photographs from his time in Singapore. But we don't actually. As we don't have the photographs, we're not, you know, we can't say much more than the fact that we know that he did portraiture there. Um, so that's where he starts off. <clears throat> yeah, he's quite prolific in terms of his publications. And what's interesting is that, um, as I said, he, he's sort of early photojournalism, as in he has photographs, but then if you've looked at any of his original works, the photographs are always then accompanied by quite long descriptive accounts, sometimes three or four pages uh, for each photograph. Um, so, so again, he's not just capturing um, the images or, or these landscapes. He's also giving quite uh, detailed uh, descriptions of the subject matter. So again, uh, if you have chance, some of these are, some of these are online for free, actually, I should, share the links at the end and you can you can browse them actually the um illustrations of china and its people four volumes um which is his classic work that's actually uh you can browse the whole thing online now um and the one we'll look at at the end street life in london which is the cover you see here um lse so london school of economics have digitized the whole thing uh, and again, you can just go onto their website and um, actually I downloaded the, the whole PDF the other day. Um, so yeah, there's quite a lot of it now available that you can browse through and, and, and read about or actually read the the um, the works. Uh, Views of the North River, which is one of his rarest uh, publications, which is photographs of the Pearl River, which is in Hong Kong. Um, apparently they're much more harder to get. Um, one of them went up for auction a few years ago for about £30,000 uh, for an original copy. So that's the sort of prices that some of these works will fetch um, at this point. But yeah, this is a selection of, of his work. We'll really focus on uh, illustrations of China and its people. We'll look at antiquities of Cambodia um, somewhat as well. And then, as I said, uh, street life in London. Yeah, what are glass plate negatives? 
yeah, caveat, I'm not a photography expert. I'm an archaeologist um, of, <laughs> of Thailand. So I'm not, I'm not from, I'm not the, yeah, I'm, if you have specific questions on this technology, I'm not the right person to ask. But um, yeah, glass plate negatives are the type of photographic technology that they used at the time. Um, so it's what you would call wet, call it in wet plate. So you had, you had a glass plate and you can see the negative on the on the screen, um, and then you would have to coat it with a chemical formula, um, and that's how they they um, created photographs. Uh, it was in use from about the eighteen fifties to eighteen eighties. Um, what's important to realize as well is that you actually had to develop it within a span of 15 minutes so this meant that john thompson had to actually bring his dark room he had to have a portable dark dark room they would have to bring to with him in the field so it's not just the camera equipment that he was looking around but actually this um portable dark room so yeah i suppose when we think today of the ease of photographs now with with mobile phones compared to what he had to um the effort he had to do it it's quite remarkable the the image quality and the the the, the depth and breadth of the documentation that he achieved um but yeah one of the other things that's really interesting and i think if you've seen the exhibition i mean what what really struck me as well when i first saw these reproductions is the clarity of the photographs. And that's because we have the glass plate negatives. They were donated by Thompson to the Welcome Collection in London. Um, actually just, he was arranging the donation as he passed away and his um, his children subsequently uh, sold or donated them to the Welcome. But the Welcome Library in London has these glass plate negatives. So what that means is that when you when you reproduce the photographs today, they're almost, if the glass plate negative is in perfect quality, then the reproduction of that photograph is also going to be um, extremely high quality. So I think you can see from um, in the exhibition, you know, it's almost like you're looking at, I feel like you're almost looking at these people, like the photographs were taken yesterday. Um, so there's a real sort of intimacy uh, between you, the viewer and the, and the subject. So they really are quite, quite amazing photographs um, because of that. You know, usually what we get with, with old photographs is that it's actually the print that survives. So it's a sort of 1870s sepia print. Um, whereas in this case, you can really, because they have the glass plate negatives, you can really reproduce them to a really high quality. Yeah, let's look at his first foray out of Singapore. He goes to Siam uh, from 1865 to 1866. And he's famous really for these two photographs. If, um, if any of you have been to Thailand, um, these, these photographs are reproduced everywhere. Uh, you see them in lots of books and catalogs and even in uh, sort of restaurants and so on and so forth. Um, these are two portraits that he did of um, King Mongkut, that's King Rama IV, uh, who reigned from 1851 to 1868. He's an, quite an important monarch in Thai history. He's the first monarch to really open up Thailand to, to the West or to start to modernize Thai society, um, both in terms of sort of the educational systems, but systems of government as well. He sends a lot of his his sons abroad to different locations, whether it's to learn um, uh, under the czars in Russia, he sends some of them to the French courts, he sends some of them to the UK. Um, so he's at this point really opening up Siam um, to the modern world and his engagement or his uh, him allowing, I think, John Thompson to photograph him as part of this larger um, movement within within Thai society at this time, where he's actually, if you read the accounts of, of Thompson, he's actually quite fascinated by the, the technology of the, of the camera and the apparatus behind it. Um, so again, Thompson gets this very early opportunity to, I think the first the first person, or the first time that any monarch in Siam is, or Siam is, is photographed. Um, so they're, they're significant in, in those ways as well. Um, 
this is an interesting portrait as well. Um, this is one of the young princesses uh, that he manages to photograph as well. And what you'll see here is, is something that's very common even today in Thai society where um, you cannot stand at the same level as the king or the monarch. So the servant is, we would call this kowtowing and in, 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 in this word has come into English language use, of course, um, or a base on, so always below the head of, of a royal figure. Um, this is also another quite significant image, um, the one on the left. The, the one on the right is, is not a John Thompson photograph, um, but this is the, when John Thompson took the photograph, um, the Crown Prince of Siam, um, who later succeeds King Munkut and becomes Rama V or King Chula Longorn. Um, who really follows in his father's footsteps in terms of modernizing and um, sort of opening up Siam, Siam to the to the modern world. Um, so again, a quite important early photograph um, of um, the future king, at this point, the future king of Thailand. Um, but what I wanted to, to also discuss today is that John Thompson, in a way, is well known for his photographs of, of monarchs and um, sort of high society people. He also, when he comes back to the UK in the in the late 70s, 1870s, 1880s, he gets a royal warrant and photographs Queen Elizabeth and other members of the British royal family. But he's also very interested in everyday life. Um, and you see this, you see this current throughout his career that he manages to photograph high society, royals, um, high ranking government officials, and the everyday people on the street with, I would argue, sort of equal sensitivity and equal sort of poise. Um, and this is a photograph of, um, of monks and their assistants. Um, again, it's from, uh, so something that would have been very common in, in um, Th Thailand or even today. Um, so again, you can see, this is an interesting photograph because he's actually combined um, two plates together. Um, so he's taken two separate photographs and he's combined them. So you can see um, there's a sort of divider down the, the middle um, and you can see this, the same people, some of the same people in each photograph. I'm not sure why he did this, what why it's sort of, this is like an early, early Photoshop, I guess. Um, but it's interesting. Yeah, the boy holding the fan is the same figure here as well. Um, yeah, and then this is another quite famous uh, photograph from Thailand. This is a, an oarsman. Um, so again, scenes of sort of everyday life. Um, the background is quite interesting as well. You start to see some of the sort of vernacular architecture of the time. Um, yeah, and then this is the other aspect of his work is, is landscape and architecture. So, so there's sort of, he's really hitting all of the bases, I guess, of, of the photographic uh, oeuvre, uh, portraiture, sort of scenes of everyday life, but then also landscape and, and architecture. And these are quite, they're, they're interesting and important historically, obviously, because then you can start to understand um, what the urban landscapes look like in in this case, the 19th century, a lot of it's changed today, um, but they also give us a sense of, of, of the type of landscape that, that was there. Uh, if, again, if any of you have, have been to Bangkok, this scene is, um, this scene would be with the royal palace behind us, looking out onto the river. Um, this temple is still there today, and again, if you yeah, if you've been to Bangkok, um, you may recognize this is what we call Wat Arun, Temple of the Dawn. Um, yeah, and he's already he's already developing what we'd call panoramic views at this point. So very early uh, photographic techniques that are quite common for us today, um, but quite innovative for the time. Actually, the Grand Palace would just be sort of just to the left of this photograph, if that helps you orientate yourself. Um, Yep, this is another uh, well-known Bangkok land, landmark. It's called the Golden Mount. Uh, this is what it looks like today. Um, when Thompson was there, they were just constructing it. So it's a natural, it's a natural hill, 
but then they actually built uh, uh sort of they extended the hill by building a large structure on top of it and um on the top they place what we call a stupa or a chedi sometimes you might be familiar with the term pagoda it's the same uh, thing it's a buddhist monument that you place a relic in usually a relic of the buddha or a relic of a, a famous monk um in this case this was built by Chulalongkorn into the Ram of the Fifth, the, the crown prince that you saw earlier. Um, and it's meant to have as a relic of the Buddha. In 1866, he moves on to Cambodia. Um, and he's the first person to, to photograph Angkor Wat, the famous uh, temple there that maybe you're, you're also familiar with. Um, he's able to do, he's inspired to do it um, by... The, there's a French nat naturalist called Henri Mouot who visited Angkor in 1860. And Mouot then made a trip up the Mekong River into, into modern day, into what is modern day Laos. And he dies of malaria um, on that trip. But his one of his um, servants actually uh, collects up his belongings, part of which is a diary. And it's sent back to France and it's published. And this is the first time that the the world or the Western world sees Angkor Wat. But it's not photographs, it's uh, sketches, so sort of woodblock prints. Um, but Thompson was aware of this and really wanted to visit. Um, and at the time, Angkor, the area of Angkor Wat is under the control of, of, of Siam, because the, the empire of Siam, Siam actually... Um, invaded uh, the region where Angkor is in the 15th century. So it, it held it for quite a long time. Um, and there's a model, if you've been to the Grand Palace in Bangkok, there's a model of um, Angkor Wat, which you see here um, in the Grand Palace that King Mongkut actually made. Um, and so at the time, the, the Thai monarchs also sort of trace their, their origins or the, the historical uh, connections back to Angkor as well. Um, so anyway, it's a it's part of the kingdom of Cambodia, but the Cambodia at this sta stage is a vassal state of of Siam. Um, but the French are also moving in, um, and the French so Cambodia becomes a, a French protectorate in 1863. But the province that um, Angkor Wat is in is still part of um, of the kingdom of Siam. It's a little bit confusing, but that's the the geopolitics at the time. Um, yeah, this is a, a photo that a photograph that he took of the of the king of of Cambodia, King Norodom, um, looking a little bit forlorn. I think he's um, the King Norodom had a very difficult situation where he's got the ties on one side and the French on the other, and they're both trying to essentially take over his kingdom, and he, it gets squeezed. Um, so you can see here the extent of of Siam um, at that time. Yeah, this is one of his early photographs of Angkor Wat. Um, the temple itself dates to the, the 12th century. It's a, a Hindu temple, one of the largest Hindu or temple structures anywhere in Southeast Asia or the world uh, at that time. This is what it looks like today if you've ever visited. Um, this is another well-known photograph that he took. This is another Angkor is a Angkor Wat. So Angkor Wat Temple, uh, this one, sorry, is the most well known. But the actual, um, if you've been there, you'll you'll realize that there's not just one temple. The this Angkor Wat is a is a large city that develops over about four hundred years, from about the eighth to thirteenth century, um, and it contains many different temples. Um, Angkor Wat is the the largest and the most well known of them. Um, but the other well-known one is called the Bayan Temple, which dates to the 13th century. And it's famous for these face towers, these sort of enigmatic towers with faces of a, of a Buddhist deity on, on, on top of them. And of course, when Thompson was there, it, it was quite an evocative photograph. The jungle has reclaimed um, this space and, and you see it, uh, you see these abandoned temples covered in, in foliage and, and roots and so on. Um, but what also happens, what happens when Thompson visits in 1866, uh, as I said, the French are already controlling quite a large part of Cambodia. 
Um, and it, it's, it creates this sort of colonial competition for Angkor um, in terms of scholarship, but also ownership in terms of you know, who actually controls Angkor, who actually gets the rights to, to research and publish on it. Um, so Henri Mouo, this French naturalist, had first come across it in 1860, but Thompson was the first person to, to photograph it. And this caused quite a stir among the French. Uh, they weren't particularly happy that uh, a Scotsman, uh, someone a part of the British Empire, had, had beaten the French to the punch, so to speak. Um, so this inspired, or this, um, there was also, a, there was a few months later, a French expeditionary um, campaign called the Mekong Exploration Commission. Um, this, this expedition, their actual objective was to navigate the Mekong River. And what they were trying to do was open trade routes with China. They wanted to see if they could navigate all the way up the Mekong River into Southern China um, as a trade route. Um, but on their way, they stopped off at, at Angkor Wat. Um, the, the leader of this expedition is a gentleman, this gentleman here called Dudar de, de la Grey. Um, he finds out about Thompson, the fact that he's already photographed it. Um, so he makes a detour um, to Angkor Wat and they actually spend a few weeks there um, documenting the uh, Angkor Wat themselves. And there's a French photographer called Emile Gassel who um, who produces most of these photographs. And again, it was sort of largely forgotten. Um, he dies quite young. He dies, I think, in Saigon in, in 1879. Um, a lot of his photographs ended up in, in the Musée Guimet, the, uh, the Guimet Museum in Paris, which is their main museum of Asian art. Um, and it's only in the last sort of 10, 15 years that scholars have been re sort of re-excavating his work from the archives and and also indicating how significant a photographer he was. So he's a contemporary of, of John Thompson. Um, so it's quite interesting that at the same time as you have John Thompson um, coming out of the British Empire, you have you have Gazelle as well in the in the French, from the French side also making these photographs. Yeah, this is one from Gazelle that he took probably just about four months after Thompson. So again, similar type of um, angle of Angkor Wat. Oops, sorry, these are two more. I won't, um, I see I'm sort of running out of time already. Um, I won't linger on these, but you get a sense of, of the photography. And then there was books published by the French also on, on Angkor Wat um, from this expedition. But it's interesting to do this. So I've put them side by side. So this is the, the exact same monument. This is the Bayon. This is on the left. You can see the photograph by Thompson. And on the right, you can see the photograph by Emile Gassel. So slightly different. Uh, Gassel has taken the photograph from slightly further back. Um, but you can see it's the exact same monument. Um, you can see here the um, where the lintel and the pediment is. It's the exact same. Um, so again, they're both um, both taking sim, you know, sort of working within similar uh, conditions. But yeah, let's move on to China. So actually, Thompson doesn't spend that long in Cambodia. It's I think it's a, only a, a few weeks, if I'm if I remember correctly. But his main um, photographs that he's famous for is, is, is his views of China, which he, so over a four year period from 1868 to 1872, he, um, he spends a number of, of, um, a number of, uh, trips back and forth. Um, he, to get access to the pho pho photography that he, he does, the photographs that he does, he, he does it in a number of ways. He, um, he teams up with a lot of uh, Scottish or British missionaries that are already active in China. Um, some of them actually speak Chinese, so that helps him um, get access. Um, he's also introduced to some um, very important uh, officials within China, the, uh, within China, which also grants him access to sort of behind the scenes shots. We'll see in a, in a moment. And one of the, the most famous is Prince Gong, and he's the youngest brother of the of the emperor at the time. Um, so he actually facilitates a lot of access for Thompson. Um, so you can see here, sort of similar to, to his photographs in, in 
in um, in Siam or Siam, I should say, where uh, he's photographing high-ranking officials or, or or the emperor. In China, he never he never manages to photograph the emperor himself. Um, one wonders whether he, he he tried to or whether he tried to get an introduction through Prince Gong, um, but that never never happened. Um, but he does manage to, to photograph uh, Prince Gong himself and then a number of other quite important um, high ranking um, Chinese officials. So you have uh, this gentleman here as well, who's the Minister of Foreign Affairs. So again, we start to get a um, a window into Chinese society at the time. And I think if you look at, at the photograph of Prince Gong in particular, the clarity of the photograph, this is one of the prints that I feel that when you when you look at it and when you sort of stand in front of it, um, I think because he's staring you know, very directly into the camera as well, that it's almost, yeah, it, it, this photo could have been taken yesterday. I feel it's, it's there's a real sense of life to it. Um, Thompson also got access to um, sort of the private lives of um, Chinese society. And this, again, would not usually be um, permissible uh, by most, not, not just Western visitors, but, but most Chinese as well. Um, so he does, he, again, when he's in Beijing, he actually um, befriends a Chinese merchant called Yang Fang. And it's this merchant that actually gives him access to uh, to his house and, and um, sort of behind the uh, behind the scenes shot. So he again he this is some of his sort of well known images are of like um, this is a Manchu bride. So she's um, in all of her finery um, before the marriage. Uh, this is a Manchu lady having her hair done. So again, it gives you sort of quite. Uh, intimate portraits of of daily life within within China. Um, I should mention though as well that what's interesting is that of course all of the photographs are staged, even though they can look quite naturalistic. Um, the shutter speed at this time would not be sufficient enough um, to have like an action shot. So if there's movement in the frame, um, the image is going to be blurred. So he he actually stages his photographs, but they, they're, again, that's quite a skill that he, he develops that, that though they're, they're staged photographs, they look, you know, quite naturalistic or quite um, realistic as he does. So this again is one of his quite, I think, remarkable photographs, which really shows the sensitivity he has in, in capturing his, his subject matter. And again, you know, we shift, we move from, from high court officials to sort of quite wealthy merchant families right down to the sort of everyday uh, person. This is what he calls an old Cantonese woman who's um, of a more working class um, uh, stratum of society. And he's very fascinated by, by this, this element of Chinese society, which you will see in the streets of London sort of continues. Um, but the photograph, the poise as well, you know, it sort of captures the dignity of this woman. Um, but he says as well, this is a quote from um, his, his work, her hair has grown thin and white, but she still dresses it with neatness and care. She still busies herself in the lighter domestic duties. She is skillful with the needle and invaluable as a nurse in time of sickness. So again, outlining her sort of work ethic, I suppose, would be the best way to put it. And again, yeah, these are his other, his street scenes of, of China. Um, so you have a traveling chiropodist, you have a traveling fruit, fruit seller. Again, I find this one interesting because he would have had to pose the shot. He would have had to compose it. So obviously there was instructions. The fruit seller would have had to have held that, that position for, I guess, at least a few seconds to actually capture it. But again, so they're 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 stage shots, but they're also, I think, quite realistic um, documentation or photo photo documentation of of daily life in China at the time. Again, these field laborers in in Amoy. Amoy is today's uh, Xiamen in Fujian province. But again, you see a similar trend where he's not just interested in. Um, 
everyday life or different aspects of Chinese society. He's also interested in the architecture. He's interested in the landscapes. And so some of his really important imagery are, are of that as well. This is apparently one of the passes at the start of the Great Wall of China. So he photographs the, the Great Wall of China as well, actually. There's, I didn't include it in this talk, but there's, I think, two images um, from his um, from his publication on China uh, that show the Great Wall. Um, but here you can see this is apparently the start of it. And this is a the Nankao Pass, which is just north of, of Beijing. Um, he also photographs these Ming tombs. They're in two different locations here. This is Nanjing, which is the former capital of, of China before it moves to Beijing, um, I think in the 15th century. Um, again, they're quite evocative photographs. We think this individual is one of his porters um, or one of his assistants that travels with him on his on this journey. Um, yeah, and then I wanted to finish up in the last uh, five minutes <clears throat> by bringing us back to to London. And I was I was unfamiliar with his his work um, in the UK until I started um, when Nerissa and Betty you know, asked me to to give this lecture. I, I started doing a bit more research on Thompson, and I came across I came across the um, the archive in yeah you can in in London School of Economics and this this um, Street Life of London work which I was quite unaware of, um, but yeah so again he he he's quite fascinating because he moves between <clears throat> the highest echelons of British society he becomes a um, a photographer to the royal family, but at the same time, he's photographing um, Victorian street life, the poverty of London at the time. Um, so it's quite it's quite fascinating how he, he can move with such ease between the two. And of course, this this image here is a uh, an image of Queen Victoria herself. But yeah, he returns in 1872. He settles in London. He's his books have made him very famous at this point. Um, but he also spends the following years lecturing and publishing um yeah and it's in 1881 that he's appointed the photographer to the british royal family um but as i said he teams up with a social a very early what we would call a socialist journalist adolphi smith um to document the poverty in london at the time and the result of that is um the photographs are accompanied with detailed descriptions and they're published in monthly installments in, in as the street lights of london in 1876 sorry in 1877 is a typo there um today the the book is one compendium but when it was when it was published at the time it was in installments um yeah and it's considered sort of one of the first early works of of um documentary photojournalism and i'll give you some examples yeah what what you'll see is that Thompson takes the photographs and Adolfo Smith writes most of the descriptive uh, or the commentary on them. Some of them are actually written by Thompson himself. So it's a collaboration between these, the two of them. Um, so I've taken a few extracts from it to, to give you an idea of, um, of what they, of how they approach the subject matter. Yeah. So Covent Garden, Flower Women, um, this is from page seven. The fruits which the earth gives gratuitously have been converted into the property of a privileged few, and the pauperized street vendor must bargain and haggle before she can obtain uh, the refuse flowers disdained by fashionable dealers. Even such simple flowers as the primrose and violet are now governed by the exonerable and iron laws of supply and demand. So <clears throat> Adolphe Smith here is making a, it's a commentary on the fact that a lot of these street sellers, the flowers that they're selling have um, are flowers that have been discarded by the the more established um, um, flower sellers within Covent Garden. Um, so they're basically these women are sort of picking up scraps and then selling them on the street. Um, and um, he gives quite a detailed account of how it's always the same women in the same spot. So this is their spot in front of um, the church's name has escaped me. I think if you 
this is the church, the kind of Greco-Roman church, right by Covent Garden, and they're sta they're standing right in front of it, um, and they would stand there every day and and hawk their goods. Um, and apparently, this individual, when they they interviewed him, would not give his name, but his nickname was Corduroy because of um, because of his clothing. Um, he's a, a day laborer. Um, yeah, this is another image. <clears throat> Excuse me. Call a dealer in fancy wear. So these again, these um, street traders that would uh, maybe not dissimilar to uh, sort of East End street traders today that are hawking uh, different types of perfumes and, and aftershaves and so on and so forth. Um, but this was popular during the Victorian period um, as well. Um, and again, he makes a bit of a commentary on it. And he says, within the last 10 years, the fancy wear trade, properly termed swag selling, has proved one of the most lucrative branches, branches of outdoor industry. The fabulous profits it was supposed to yield and the small outlay required for stock tempted so many of the street folks to take to the swag board um, that the trade has been overdone, the market glutted, and so many old hands forced, in, forced to abandon the streets and take to indoor employment. <clears throat> so basically what, what he commentates on here is that this was quite a lucrative trade. And then of course, everybody starts to get in on it and um, and then they they sort of spoil the market. Uh, but again, really quite intimate photographs of um, of Victorian street selling, um, the woman with carrying the child is quite, uh, and she's sort of glancing at the objects. Um, this is quite an interesting one as well. I guess this is, a tradition that's almost died out. Of course, it's a, a shoe black or, or shoe polish, um, shoe polisher. And he's an interesting character. It's this individual here. He's called Jack Jacobus Parker, um, dramatic reader, shoe black and peddler. And Adolphe Smith gives quite a long account of, of and interviews uh, Jack Jacobus Parker. And so he he wasn't quite an actor, but he's what they call a dramatic reader. So he gives an account of the fact that he used to play uh, uh, used to play um, roles in the theater, and he used to uh, play a number of, of Shakespearean roles. So he was a he was a sort of day a, a jobbing actor um, that never made it uh, never made it successful, but but made a living out of acting. But then also worked as a um, a, a shoe black or a shoe polisher as well. Um, so yes. He says, dramatic reader, shoe black and peddler is represented in the accompanying photograph at his accustomed pitch. Although the career of Parker has been clouded and his life story is one of struggle and disappointment, yet he has fought with the battle bravely and as a veteran is not without his scars. Yeah, uh, this is another image. So these are the, uh, again, within Covent Garden, um, which again was famous as a flower market. Um, and so what would happen is, is this, once the sellers had made their transactions, then you would have these uh, odd laborers or day, day, day laborers who would then carry the bundles of uh, flowers to the, um, to the purchaser. So he, again, takes quite a lot of, uh, spends a lot of time focusing on that as well. Um, what am I doing? Yeah, yeah, these, are, the odd men, as they are sometimes called, are paid for each commission they execute, for every parcel they deliver. Indeed, they are often paid twice over, uh, once by the tradesman who has sold them some flowers and again by the purchaser on the receipt of the same. In busy times, therefore, these men may occasionally make as much as two pounds and ten shillings in a week. On the other hand, during the, during the dull season, they often pass entire days without earning anything at all and at best scarcely obtain enough to, to procure the barest necessities of life. The greater number of these men are, are bred and born in the immediate neighborhood, and not a few are qualified under the generic term of several, seven dials Irish. So yeah, it gives you a, quite a good sense of their day-to-day -day, um, existence. Um, I've just got two more and then I'll, I'll sort of wrap up. Yeah, this is another interesting one. He looks at the... Um, what they call the silent highway, which is the the barges, oh, sorry, the the canals, 
And by this point in time, um, these water, these men that work, work, work on the waterways, which, which used to be a very profitable um, profession, either as ferrymen across the Thames or, or working on the, the canals, um, it's essentially being replaced now by rail, by um, better road systems, and so on and so forth. So actually the profession of a, of a boatman uh, has become quite um, quite arduous and, and the pay is not very good. Um, and he talks about um, in this, not I haven't quoted it here, but in this section, he talks about the fact that you have large families living within very cramped conditions within these uh, barges, because of course they actually lived on the barges as well. Um, so again, you get these sort of images of sort of Dickensian uh, London, of sort of cramped, very cramped living conditions. Um, but yeah, what he says here is that though so much has been said of late concerning our canal population and the evils attendant to their mode of life, the men who have the more difficult task of conducting clumsy barges down the swift ebb and flow of the Thames have been comparatively neglected. A long list of grievances may be nevertheless, nevertheless drawn up concerning this class. So again, he's trying to sort of investigate different forms. Yeah, and then this is the last one I have, um, old furniture. So again, about a street seller um, that hawks his wares in Hoburn. So again, sort of very close to where uh, Stoas is located. Um, yeah, so he says, at the corner of Church Lane, Hoburn, Hoburn, there was a secondhand furniture dealer whose businesses was to cross between that of a shop and a street stall. The dealer was never dis never satisfied until the leather, sorry, unless the weather allowed him to disgorge nearly the whole of his stock into the middle of the street a method which alone secured the approval and custom of his neighbours. As a matter of fact, the inhabitants of Church Lane were nearly all what I may call, may term, street folks, living, buying, selling, transacting all their businesses in the open street. It was a celebrated resort for tramps and coasters of every description, men and women who hawk during the day and evening the flowers, fruits and vegetables they buy in the morning at Covent Garden. So yeah, I just wanted to finish by uh, sort of putting a few of these images side by side. I think, you know, from the street views of London, you really get a sense of, um, of how both Thompson and Adolphus Smith really try and capture the day-to-day -day life of, um, of London at the time. And it's very similar to what Thompson was uh, doing in China as well, you know, this, these are the, the day laborers in, in Amoy and in, in, in Shaman, and here you have the day laborers in London. And so two very similar social groups or social classes, but in quite different cultural contexts, obviously. Um, but again, you can sort of see in the in the staging and the the framing of the shops of the the shot quite a quite a sort of comparisons uh, between the two. Again, these street scenes of uh, here you have the the shoe polisher, and then in the Chinese example you have the chiropodist. So again, sort of interesting sort of parallels that pop up between the two of them. Yeah, and then in the last slide I have, there's a certain sort of egalitarianism of the lens in, in I think, Thompson's work. Here you have one of the most revered figures in, in Siam, in, in Thailand, uh, King Munkut, um, in all of his regalia, his royal regalia. And then on, on this shot, you have a, a, a working class woman from uh, Canton. But they're both captured with, you know, real poise and sensitivity and, and a sort of um, appreciation of the subject. So I think it, it's really a testament to his career and his ability of a as a photographer that he will capture any human subject with sort of equal, equal care and consideration. And yeah, just to, to sum up, yeah, he really was a, a pioneer of early photographer, photography, um, not just in terms of where he went. He was the first person, like I say, to photograph in, in uh, Siam, in Cambodia, and in China, but really in terms of the repertoire and, and his ability 
you know, it ranges from portraits to landscapes to, to street, uh, street scenes. And he captures rich and poor alike with equal grace and magnanimity. Um, he's also important. He develops these early forms of social commentary and photojournalism. Um, and he opened up never before uh, vistas and views of the Far East. Uh, he dies in Edinburgh um, at the age of 84. And this is the, it, there's a plaque on, on the building where he died. So yeah, I will leave it at that. Thanks. Let me stop.